sense the ministry of your spirit we've already sensed today. As we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, well, I just wanted to speak to you this uh, few uh, minutes this morning. As you can see from the title, Women Worth Following. And we're going to look at three women in the Bible that I believe we can learn a lot from. And kind of the jumping off verse is in uh, Genesis chapter number 2, verse 22. So I'll go ahead and just read that. In case you wondered, where did women come from? Well, the Bible says right here. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And I'll go ahead and read verse 23. It won't be up there. And the man said, Now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And so you blame God for women. Those of you, when you get frustrated, no, we don't blame God for women. We appreciate the wonderful gift when God looked at Adam and said it's not good for man to be alone and so he created a helpmate and that's in no way is in the Hebrew a derogatory term it means someone to stand alongside a co-equal to support each other and that's what the women in our lives do and uh, so we're going to look as I said at uh, three of them today but uh, have you ever noticed how the Bible's full of stories as a matter of fact, most of the Bible is given in story format. Now, rest assured, there's teaching, doctrine, genealogies, prayers, proverbs, all that kind of stuff in the Bible. But the vast amount of God's Word is given in a story format. Story of Adam and Eve, Noah's flood, Abraham's call, David and Goliath, uh, uh, Daniel in the lion's den, Jesus calming the storm, Peter, and, uh, Peter walking on the water, Paul and Silas in prison, and the list goes on and on. And why is that? Why does God give so, us so many stories? Well, it's because we can learn so much from the examples of people that have gone before us and how they lived and how God interacted with them. And then, of course, the non-story format, the teaching, the doctrine, all that, helps us draw the right conclusions from the story. But the stories illustrate the truth of God's Word. And so the Bible's full of stories we're to learn from. And uh, we'll learn what we should do through these stories, what we should not do. We see evidence of God's faithfulness, how God saw them through. And ultimately, as we learn from these stories, it builds our faith up. And of course, through the Bible, there's a lot of great men in a lot of great stories. I mentioned a few of them. Abraham, David, Paul, Peter, James, Andrew. The list goes on and on. But... There's also a lot of tremendous godly women found in the Bible. And this is kind of unique in ancient literature, such as the Bible, ancient sacred text, is that in the Bible, God over and over again uses women and shows women of faith as examples to live by. And so we're going to look at three of them today in the series I've entitled Women Worth Following. And the truth that we'll be looking at, it doesn't just apply to women. It's for all of us, young, old, man, woman. All of us can learn from their examples. And the first ones we're going to look at is probably two women that you haven't given a whole lot of thought to, if any, at all. You may not even have ever heard of them, but they are Shifra and Pua, and they are found in the book of Exodus chapter number 1, verses 15 through 17, is part of their story. The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about them, but what the Bible says about them speaks volumes to us. And so, uh, set the story up, uh, Israelites uh, are in Egypt now, they're slaves, but God continues to bless them. They keep expanding and growing, and the, the, the Israelites get more and more people to the point that Pharaoh's afraid that if the enemy would attack them, the Israelites would join the enemy and be able to defeat the Egyptians. And so he comes up with a brilliant plan. Well, what we'll do is whenever a male child is born, we will kill that child. Isn't that a great plan? He's a great guy here. And so we pick up the reading in verse 15 of chapter 1. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, Then you are helping 
or when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on, deliver, on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Then watch verse 17. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. And I know sometimes when you're reading the Bible and you're, just, you're not thinking a whole lot, you may just skim over something like that. But let's stop and think about what they did here. Here they are standing before the most, probably the most powerful man on earth at that time, the Pharaoh of Egypt. He could just speak the word, kill them, and without trial, without um, any kind of due process, without appeal, they would be dead or throw them in prison. They'd be thrown in prison. His will was done. And uh, they're standing before the most powerful man in all the world and these are Hebrew midwives they are slaves they hold no power no position whatsoever to stand up against Pharaoh and Pharaoh gives him a direct order and when you are given a direct order in that time period by Pharaoh you obey it or you bear the consequences of it and so they had a lot to fear when it came to Pharaoh but I love how the Bible puts it in verse 17. The midwives, however, feared God. Now that word fear doesn't mean they're cowering in the corner hoping God doesn't zap them with a lightning bolt type fear. It is a reverence for God. Understanding that he ultimately is in control and he's got them in his hands. And so they have this reverence and this awe of God. And they fear God more then they feared what the Pharaoh, what Pharaoh could do to them. And so what we can learn, and I'm going rapid form here, what we can learn from Shifra and Pua is obedience. That we can have courage to obey. And let me tell you something, sometimes obedience does, or I should say a lot of times, does take courage to do. Now some obedience... We, you could say it's kind of easy because the path is laid before you. Maybe it's something you even want to do or people are applauding you or they're encouraging you along or the resources are there and you know, yeah, I can do this and that's no problem and it's not going to disrupt things too much or make anyone too mad or go in a different direction I didn't want to go in. And so some obedience is easy to step into. But other obedience is hard. It's sacrificial. It's difficult. And some obedience, it takes courage to fear God in the way I described. Having that reverence for him. Understanding who he is and his character and his nature. And, and bowing before him in that type of fear of God. More than we fear what might happen if we obey. Because you know how our minds are. We always think of the worst possible thing that could happen, right? At least I do. Oh, if I obey God here, then this will happen, and that will happen, and that will happen, and that will happen. And 95% of the time, let's say, it never works out that way. But even if it does, even if the immediate obedience does require extreme sacrifice, does require a step of faith, does require you going through a hard time because of your obedience, it is still worth it. Obedience is always worth it, even when it's hard or costly. I'm thinking of a lady that um, went to the Bradford Church, and she was just a wonderful, humble servant of Christ. And she did her best to raise her kids up in the ways of the Lord. But her husband uh, just wanted nothing to do with God, and he didn't want her serving the Lord. It wasn't just, well, I'll stay at home and you do what you want. No, he actively fought her serving the Lord. To the point we found out later that he would physically abuse her because she'd want to go to church or want to do this, that, or the other for the Lord. And yet, she remained faithful to God. And it wasn't easy. And I don't want to just gloss over that like, oh, yeah, she remained faithful. No, it wasn't easy at all. 
But today she's in heaven. I wonder what she'd say if you'd ask her, was that worth it? <laughs> of course, obedience with, uh, to God is always worth it. And he will give you the courage to obey if you ask him. And so if you're facing something where you know God has something he wants you to do or give or to say or whatever it is, and fear is keeping you from walking in that, learn from these two godly women, Shifra and Pua, that you can have courage to obey in the Lord. Well, let's look at another person here. This one you probably have heard of, this person. Her name is Ruth. How many here have heard of Ruth? <laughs> There's a whole book in the Bible uh, concerning her story. And uh, just a, one of the beautiful love stories of all of ancient literature, actually, let alone in the Bible. But before we get into the story of Ruth, let me quickly give you the background. It really starts with another lady named Naomi. Naomi was a Hebrew woman, married, and had two sons, and a famine came into the land, and so uh, they, the family decided to move to the land of Moab to survive. And so they move there, and in the due course of time, Naomi's husband dies. And so she is left with her two sons. Well, they end up marrying Moabite women, because that's the land in which they're living in. One woman's name is Oprah. No, not Oprah Winfrey. This was for her time. Uh, the other was named Ruth. And so they're getting along and living there. But then, tragically, her two sons die. And so now you have a household with Naomi being widowed, Oprah being widowed, and Ruth being widowed. And this is a very dire situation, especially in that culture. Even in our culture, this would be a terrible situation for someone to go through. But in that culture... Uh, just a period of that time, women typically weren't able to go out and just get a job and earn a living. And, and so they just, they didn't know what they were going to do. The, the future looked absolutely bleak. Not only were they dealing with the emotions of losing uh, their husband and their sons and, and all of that, but they're also dealing with the harsh reality of their economic situation. And so what, or what uh, Naomi decides to do is, look, I'd, I'm not even in a Moabite. I'm in Israel. I need to go back to Israel. There's some provisions under the law of Moses that maybe will help take care of me. But she tells her two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Oprah, now this is your homeland. You stay here. You're young enough. You can get remarried and go on with your lives. Let me go back to Israel and try and make ends meet there. Well, Oprah takes her up on that advice, for better or for worse, and that's the last we hear of Oprah in the Bible. But Ruth, Ruth is a picture of faithfulness. Because somewhere in this dynamic that the Bible doesn't really say, Ruth begins to have faith in the God of Israel. Remember, she's a Moabite. She was raised pagan. She was raised worshiping pagan gods. But somewhere in this whole thing she began to put faith in the true God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and so she tells Naomi I'm not going anywhere wherever you go I go your land will be my land your people will be my people and your God will be my God <coughs> and so Naomi and Ruth go back to Israel and Ruth is just showing faithfulness and taking care of Naomi and uh, they get back there and uh, they're poor, and Ruth is gleaning the fields for food. And what that is, under the law of Moses at that time, when you had a field and you got it harvested, if grain were to drop on the floor of you know while you're harvesting, you were to leave it there. And then there were also, also other portions of the field that they were to just leave for the poor to be able to come and glean that up and have food to eat is one of the provisions for the poor under the law of Moses. And so obviously Ruth and Naomi are poor because Ruth is out gleaning the fields. And she ends up in this field of a guy named Boaz, one of the leaders of the community. And Boaz takes notice of her. First of all, because he 
of how hard and diligent she's working. She's just out there every day, outworking everybody. And then, you know, he's a guy and Ruth ain't too bad looking either. So he notices that too. And so he asks, who is this? And they tell him the story of how she came back. She was a Moabite, but came back with Naomi and so on and so forth. And so Boaz comes up to Ruth and begins to extend kindness to her. And this is where we'll pick up the reading and uh, verse number 10 of uh, Ruth chapter 2, by the way. <coughs> At this, because he's shown some kindness to her, she, meaning Ruth, bowed down with her face to the ground and she asked him, Boaz, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? And Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father, your mother, and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord. And then watch this last phrase. The God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. See, she's not just tagging on to Naomi because she didn't have anywhere else to go. She is putting her faith and her trust in the God of Israel. And many of you know the rest of the story that goes on from there. Boaz ends up marrying Ruth. And there's a beautiful story of redemption that, that is also an illustration of how Christ redeems us that we don't have time to get into today. But he ends up marrying Ruth. And so the one who used to glean the field is now a co-owner of the field. And not only that, how many here have heard of King David in the Bible? Pretty important guy, right? Arguably the greatest king Israel ever had. A type of Christ in the direct lineage of Jesus. Well, guess who the great-grandmother of David gets to be? Ruth. God places Ruth, this Moabite woman in the direct lineage of Jesus Christ himself. And what can we learn from Ruth through all this? That faithfulness to God is always worth it. We can learn to be faithful to God. And just like God saw Ruth's faithfulness, he sees your faithfulness. He sees what you do for him out of the limelight that no one else knows about. He sees you being true, being honest, doing what is right, avoiding temptation. He sees you, teacher, diligently preparing for that lesson and you don't know if this Sunday you'll have 20 in your class or 10 in your class or 5 in your class or 1 in your class, but, but you're still prepared. He sees that faithfulness. He sees you supporting his work when you could put the money in 10,000 other places. He sees you giving to others out of your own need. He sees you reacting kindly to that harsh word, praying for your enemies. He sees these things that we do in our faithfulness to God. He sees it and none of it is lost to him. And he will reward us in due time. I love what he says here. Boaz tells Ruth, and I believe God tells us, that we will be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So keep being faithful. Keep plugging along, one foot in front of the other, one day after the other. Just keep being faithful and raising your kids in the ways of the Lord. Keep being faithful in your job. Keep being faithful in your marriage. Keep being faithful in your service to the Lord and what he's calling you to do. God sees faithfulness and will reward it. That's what we learned from Ruth. And then very quickly, one more here. And this is a woman whose name is Rahab. Many of you know her story. And before we get into that, let me start by asking you a question, a rhetorical question. Do you think someone who was raised as an absolute pagan in a godless, depraved society 
who was an idol worshiper, who was part of a people that were an enemy, an absolute enemy of God's people, who was also a harlot by profession. I mean, this is what she did for a living. Do you think that person would ever be put on a list with Abraham, with Noah, with David, and other great people of faith? Well, the answer to that is a capital Y-E-S. Yes. And her name is Rahab. And what we learn from Rahab is that God can redeem anybody and anything. Nothing is beyond the redemptive touch of Jesus. And uh, I don't have time to get into all the details, but Israel is going to be attacking Jericho. And Rahab, raised in this pagan culture, hears about this God of Israel that delivered them out of Egypt and that's done these great miracles and has provided for them in this in the desert and somewhere along the line she begins to abandon the fake and false gods and beliefs that she had been holding on to and begins to embrace a faith in the God of Israel. And so when the spies come into the land of Jericho, the city of Jericho, to search it out, uh, they come to her house uh, to hide out and Rahab expresses her faith in God of Israel. She says, we know we're toast. We know God's given you all this. And so in, re in, in response to my kindness in hiding you, and then she also helped them escape. <coughs> she said, please remember me and those in my household when you come and spare our lives. And so they agreed to do that. And of course, Israel comes to Jericho, and you know the story. They march around once a day, time, once a day for six days, the seventh day, they march seven times around, blow the trumpets, the walls fall down, they go in and they take the city. And that's where we're going to pick up the reading here in Joshua 6, verse 23. So the young men, these were the spies that originally went to Rahab, the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. She was saved from certain destruction because she put her faith in God, in the true God. Say, well, that's a nice story. Well, it goes even beyond that. Because what we find, you know, I mentioned Boaz. Well, guess who Boaz is related to? Boaz is related to Rahab. She's in the lineage of Christ. She is also put in the lineage of Jesus. Think about that. This woman who was a harlot lived about a sinful, godless life as you could. But because she put her faith in Christ, or her faith in the God of Israel, I should say, because of that, she was redeemed, saved, from certain destruction and honored to be put in the very lineage of Jesus, as the book of Matthew points out. And in Hebrews chapter 11, which is we call the great hall of faith chapter, because in it the writer of Hebrews lists all these great people of faith, Abraham and David and Daniel, and the list goes on and on. The people we emulate, people we that are cheering us on. And in that list is Rahab. Can you believe that? As an example of faith. That's the redeeming power of God. And what we can learn from her is, as I said, nothing is beyond God's redemption. No one is beyond God's redemption. No one is too far gone, so keep praying for that wayward son, that wayward daughter. Keep praying for that neighbor. No situation is too dire that it goes beyond God's reach. There's no pit so deep that God's grace cannot go deeper, and there is no sickness, no hurt, no pain, no situation that is greater than God's healing touch or greater than his power. 
He will redeem it all if we will let him. You say, how do we let him redeem it? Surrender and trust. Just like Rahab. She surrendered. I mean, she took her own life in her hands, hiding these spies out in her home. She surrendered. She trusted. And she got redeemed. And the same can hold true to us. So these are the women we can learn great things from. And you may say, well, that's, that's good, but these stories seem kind of unrelated. This might be like a scattergun message where everything just goes out and you hope something hits with somebody. <laughs> you know, it doesn't connect a whole lot. But they're really not because there is one underlying thing through it all. God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness to redeem and reward when we do what we need to do and walk with him. I mean, if I could put it all together, I'd summarize it this way. God can redeem anything if we remain obedient and faithful to him. Let me say that again because that's really the message I believe God has for us. God can redeem anything, including you, including whatever situation you're facing, he can redeem it. He can work it. He can bring good out of it. He can bring you through it victoriously in his time and in his way. If we remain obedient and faithful. That's our part. And we see that in the story of Shifra and Pua, the obedience. In the story of Ruth and the faithfulness and Rahab and the redemption. But you know the great thing is I don't even have to look at the Bible to see this is true. I see it in the stories of others I know. I see it in the stories of some of you sitting out there that I know your story. That God's redeeming what you're going through. God's bringing you through it. And what Satan meant for evil, God is turning for good. Some of you are in the middle of that. Some of you are at the end of it. Some of you have been through it and can testify, amen, he will and he does. Because it's not just stories in the Bible. It's what we live out when we are obedient and faithful. And may I say the same can be true for your story as well. So, Dad, you can come to the piano. We're just going to end by praying uh, specifically for the women of our church, but this obviously applies to all of us. And so, application, stay obedient and faithful in whatever it is you're facing today. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't pull back. Keep praying. Keep serving, keep giving, keep believing, keep trusting. Each day by God's grace, just wake up and say, I'm going to put one foot in front of the other and keep going with God. Believing and knowing that God is at work in the background redeeming your situation. And so we're going to pray a prayer of blessing over the ladies of our church. And so if we could all stand... And what I'd like to do, if we could, is uh, if there is a lady beside you, and ladies, you can put your shoulders on each other too, that you feel comfortable doing this. I don't want anyone to be uncomfortable, but just put your hand upon the, the ladies around you, and let's just pray God's blessing over them, and let's pray that God will help us all stay obedient and faithful to Him. Father, we thank you so much for these examples you've given us in your word. And we thank you, Father, that these are not just nice little stories, but these are spiritual realities we can lean on. In the darkest of times, when in the flesh, Lord, there doesn't seem to be any hope at all, when we don't see how in the world you can work this out, but Lord, you are faithful to redeem it as we remain faithful and obedient to you. So I pray a special blessing over the ladies of our church. Lord, they carry such burdens. They do so much for the body of Christ, so much for their families, so much for their marriages, so much for their friends. Women by nature generally are just giving and giving and giving. 
And so, Father, pour into them every grace they need, the encouragement and the strength they need. And I just pray they would know, most of all, that they are loved of you. And, Lord, I pray for all of us. May we take these truths and remember them the next time we're discouraged, the next time Satan whispers in our ear, there's no use, there's no hope, give up, give in, that, Father, we will put our foot down and say, never. For our God is faithful. I am trusting in Him. He is my shelter. He is my refuge. He is my protector. And may we learn from these women to remain faithful and obedient to you and that you will redeem in your time and your way. Thank you, Lord, for these truths. And by your grace, I pray you would help us walk in them as we pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Thank you for being here, ladies. We do have a flower for you as you leave. So be sure to grab a flower as you leave as our gift to you. And have a great rest of the Mother's Day.